Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome Mr. Peter Bartholomew. He is currently Vice President at IRC Limited, and he is also a council member and, before me, President of the Royal Asiatic Society of Korea Branch. Um, briefly, I'd like to introduce him. He was born and educated in New York, and in 1967 he arrived in Korea as a member of the Peace Corps. From 68 until 72, he resided in Kangno on the East Coast in the Songgyodang Estate, which is Korea's largest and best preserved great house of the Joseph period. And during that time, he first engaged intensively in learning about Korean traditional architecture and culture, receiving guidance from elderly upper class Koreans who had been born in the late Joseon period. And then he went on living in Korea. From 1973 until 82, he was director of the Million Group of Companies. And then since 1982, he has been vice president of IRC Limited. And this company is engaged in organizing the construction, uh, on behalf of international owners, of commercial trading vessels and especially multidiscipline steel structures for the offshore oil and gas industries. But above all, for the past 47 years, he has lived in a beautifully preserved Hanok in Seoul and has been engaged in activities designed to educate people about the characteristic features of authentic Korean architecture and in campaigns to prevent the willful destruction in the name of development of the few Hanok still surviving in Seoul. And in the course of this campaign, especially, he has given countless interviews to the press and media in Korea. Uh, for his efforts on behalf of Hanok Preservation, he was made an honorary citizen of Seoul in 2010, and he received the Sejong Award for Cultural Contributions from the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism in 2012. He is currently a member of the Presidential Committee for Cultural Enrichment. Uh, it should be clear by now that Mr. Bartholomew is supremely qualified to talk to us about traditional Korean buildings, so I would like you to welcome Mr. Bartholomew with a warm round of applause. <clears throat> this on? Oh good, okay. First of all, it's a great honor to be asked to speak in front of this organization and the very uh, high intelligent crowd that I see in front of me. Um, the main purpose of this lecture is not limited only to Hanok. It's limited to the whole broad spectrum of Korean architecture. One of the major aspects of traditional culture in Korea is how little known it is worldwide. Indeed, the, one of the tragedies in addition to architecture is the extent to which the understanding of Korean traditional culture has faded from knowledge and indeed the souls of Koreans themselves. This is probably more poignant in the architecture than any other single section. Indeed, while you are living here in Korea, and you look around, there's almost nothing left, is there? When you go to Europe, everywhere you walk, everywhere you drive, ride in a car, you see the history, you see the architecture, and it speaks to you, doesn't it? Of that period, of that era, of its function, a fortress, a house, a castle, schloss, whatever. In Korea, there's no reminder. We have the impression that there really isn't anything here. Maybe there never was. There are only these tiny little morsels of palace here or some temples there. My purpose today is, if I can technically figure this out, there we go, wow. <laughs> Firstly, to present what are the aspects that are unique and sophisticated in the architecture. Secondly, to give you, as in Britain, we have what's called the Doomsday Book, which is the record of what was there before the, the French attacked. <laughs> uh, they probably improved it, but don't say that to the British. Yes. Royal palaces, provincial administrative centers in the countryside, military compounds, Confucian shrines and schools, aristocratic estates, Buddhist temples, and of course, common residences. Those are the general categories of what was here. 
The demolitions that took place, the first massive demolitions were in 1910 to 45, and the Japanese destroyed somewhere on the order of 97 to 98% of all monumental architecture in the country, except for Buddhist temples. 50 to 53, war. Mind you, the Japanese demolitions, that was not war. That was bulldozers and demolition crews. The war, more loss. 1960s up until today and continuing today, demolitions in the name of development. And the reasons for the post-53 uh, night after the war, um, we'll go into in more detail. And then finally, maybe a little bit of hope on the horizon, the uh, projects to recover losses, raise awareness, and the rest. We'll begin with, this is kind of irritating, <laughs> we'll begin with the cultural values divided into three categories, the scientific part, the art and high forms of artisan craft, and philosophy and literature in the structures. In the science, when the building is designed, it's designed for the site and the other way around. You have to find a site that's suitable for the building. A lot of people have heard of Peng Su or Feng Shui in China. And most Western people say, oh, it's a lot of superstitious nonsense and all that. Fine, we've got these aspects where, this is pretty weak, yes, here we go. Um, the building is here and you have a cosmic force from the mountain above it. There has to be water flowing in front for purity. You have the Dragon Hill on the right, the White Tiger Hill on the left, all these cosmic forces. Fine if you don't subscribe to that. This is, of course, borrowed from China. But in addition to that, in addition to that, are surveys of the land, the watershed, the, um, the climate, I'm sorry, I've only done this lecture in Korean. This is like the third time I've done it in English. We're having a little trouble here. Um, the wind direction and um, rainfall in the four months out of the year and snow. And then, of course, the ground. What is the viscosity, the strength of the soil? All of those are all part of Peng Su or Feng Shui. 3,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago and today. Just briefly... <clears throat> Here's a typical Korean building. This is really a Hanok scale. So what have we got? We have clay insulation in the floor and in the roof. We have a floor that is heated totally wall to wall by a fire that heats stones. The roof is designed such that the eaves send the rain outside of the granite platform on which it's built. And that's the important part as well. All of the Korean traditional buildings are built on a platform to lift it off the ground, get more air through it, get it away from the moisture of the soil below it. And of course, very important, you have to allow for the firebox, fireplace if you will, and this whole heating system, this entire area here, the foundation, is one big furnace. The whole damn thing is a furnace, which is uh, quite remarkable. So the rain falls off the roof outside, and what happens then? It splatters, but it'll never splatter on the wood. So no matter how much the rain falls, the wood and the doors never get hit. And of course, there's no better insulation than a high viscosity clay. I see these books that say, oh, Koreans put mud on their roof. Well, it's not mud. It's like the lowest grade of pottery clay. Or in uh, Mexico, adobe. It's that kind of a... Indeed, if you mix it with water and squeeze it, it holds its form, just like making a pot or something like that. It's that heavy and thick. So you put it in the roof. And the other nice thing is, you see that these angles are low and then a sharper angle and then you put a wattle on top of it and then you put the clay going the other way from left to right you also have a raising of the eaves but of course they're uneven so when you put all the clay on it it's as thick as 
on a big building one meter at its deepest place, like here, but then the roof is molded, molded to the shape, the depth, the curves from left to right, top to bottom, so it's convex, actually, that the owner wants and the spirit of what, what he thinks is beautiful. I have seen the building of new traditional buildings, not in recent years done right, but nevertheless, where the owner with his educated friends sit in front of the building while they're doing this and shout at the workers, a little higher on the right. And his friend says, no, you ignoramus. No, 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 it's much less aesthetic if you do that. Now, if you lower it, and they just argue and argue over this, and sometimes they actually take it all off and start all over again until they get the aesthetics absolutely perfect. We'll go into that a little more later. Sunlight. The length and angle of the eaves is such that in summer it's cool, i.e. it's sharp angle down so very little sun comes in and in the winter maximum sun comes in. Most importantly, and nobody believes it until you go to a traditional house when it's pouring rain with a heavy wind and you'll be shocked. Rain never hits the walls of the house. It's, it's amazing. Uh, where rain might hit it, they would put a stone wall, but that would only be outside. In this front area where you have a courtyard, the wind rushes by and the structure is built knowing what the climate is, the, vo the volume of rain and, and wind, so that it creates a suction, actually, in this area as it rushes by. No rain ever hits these doors. No wind ever hits the doors. I was sitting in my Hanok here in Seoul about four years ago and a typhoon came offshore Incheon. And I was really scared so I rushed home in my car because it was blowing like mad and I sat right here in this place with my feet outside on the steps and sitting just inside and I watched as signboards were flying by and parts of trees are flying by. It's terrible. Don't give me too much trouble. I smoke. <laughs> and so I lit a cigarette and the smoke just went straight up. And outside it's, it's, you know, it's a typhoon, my God. And that was absolute proof. Worse yet, the smoke went up and went out because of the suction that I just described. So that, that to me was proof positive of this particular science. Oops, we're going to run out of time. <laughs> right. On the basic layout, in, this, in the introduction just given, it was very interesting because... Sorry, there we go. This is the fundamental layout. The kitchen is on the end, usually, of the house. It is a sunken floor kitchen, and these are the places where you light a fire in, in uh, previous years, still in some Hanok, you cook on a coal or a wood fire. But these three cooking places are at a lower level than the surface of the next room. So every time you light a fire and cook, it heats the room at the same time. It's a kind of 2,000-year-old energy-saving device, or green energy, if you like. This is the anpang, the master's room for master and wife to live. Because you light the fire three times a day, it's the warmest room, so that's why the master is there. The next room is not heated, called the marubang, a parquet floor room. And this is, this is not used for living normally. And then what's called the konapang, konapang, which is for the children. Then there would be more rooms here and maybe more rooms across. The main point here is that the rooms, the heated floor rooms, are not divided by function. There is no living room, there is no dining room, there's no, there's no separate bedroom where you only sleep here, you only eat here. There's no study where you only read books in. Each room is divided per person. So this is the owner's room, this is the son's room, the next one is son number two, etc. And the occupant does all his functions there. He sleeps there, he eats there, 
He entertains there, studies, reads books there. That's the way the traditional life was. As time has evolved, the use of Hanukkahs has also changed. So now we're seeing people adopting the Hanuk for Western living by taking this room and calling it the living room and then uh, maybe making this a dining room and westernizing the use, which I don't object to as long as they don't tear the place apart and change it and make it look like a Western house. Right. So just to summarize, you have a raised platform keeping it off of the um, off of the earth and allowing the heating system. The uh, building design, position, and layout is driven by the site and climate, purpose of building, and aesthetics. Clay and roof walls for installation. Oh, I didn't mention. Under the entire structure, underground, they put a bed of charcoal, which absorbs moisture and, pre and again, prevents moisture coming in. So moisture as you well know, water is the greatest enemy of a wood building for rock purposes. So you've got charcoal under it, you've got the roof extending that doesn't allow any rain to hit the walls, you have the undle floor which continually chases out the moisture. So it's, it's an extremely well designed um, structure. The, probably the single most creative scientific part is the ondo. Literally, it translates as hot stone heating system. No other culture in the world has applied a heat retention and slowly releasing system to the entire floor. Many, there are several cultures, people say, ah, the Baths of Caracalla in Rome. Right. In the bathhouse. And only in the bathhouse. And most of them are not in the floor, they're in the walls. There are some, they put some heat under it, but it wasn't a daily for every single room in the house except only the one parquet floor room. Just to show you really quickly, you have, this is the surface of the floor, which is covered actually by a very thick paper which is lacquered or oiled. Under that is a layer of clay, under that are very thick, very broad stones. Under that is, are these flues, which are shaped like this. There are maybe five or six of these flues. And this is where you light the fire. The fire comes in and heats this huge mass of stone and clay. But look how it's designed. First it comes in and it's very broad because the fire is the hottest here. And that's to make sure that there's and even a double stone so that it's not too hot. The purpose being to have even heat, not hot in one place and cold in the other. And it works. They've had about 2,500 years to develop it and they've got it down right now. And it, uh, so it goes up at a different speed. If you look here, you have the fire coming and it vectors and drops soot, vectors again and again is slow down to allow the heat to go and then crunches up to speed it up and then out the flue. If you climb up on the roof and feel the smoke, it's cold smoke. <coughs> Virtually 100% of all the heat is absorbed into the floor. If you light five small pieces of wood, maybe this big around, no, this big around, it holds the heat with no additional fire, you just fire it once a day, for 25, 30 hours. So it's an incredibly efficient form of, of heating. Just really quick, it's well developed for different architecture. So you have the, the fireplace here, 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 here. And it depends where you can put the fireplace, where you can put the chimney. So they developed all these sophisticated flow patterns to permit different architectural, what's going on? Architectural changes uh, because of the building's placements. Where is it? <laughs> right, here are two friends of mine, probably about 120 years ago, just before I came to Korea, building an, an ondol in a small room. So I think they're sitting where the chimney is, and these are the horizontal flues, and this is the capping, this is the capping stone. So the fire comes in, heats all this mass, which is clay and, and just round stones, 
heats this and then there's more clay on top of it and goes out the chimney. And it's all this mass that absorbs the heat. In a monumental building, like a palace, this central portion here is wooden floor and these are heated floor. But the fire goes through the entire building very deep with incredible absorption of heat, huge mass. Sometimes there are two or even three fireplaces to heat the major palace thing. I mean, the worst thing is a cold king. You know, this is, this is especially in an absolute monarchy, off with his head, you know, that great stuff, yeah. This has been going on well over 2,000 years. This is just one example that I found for this lecture. This is Pare Kingdom, so it was sometime 698 to 982 AD, remains of floor system. They have found these going back to about 150 BC in different forms. Aesthetics in design in traditional architecture. Everyone talks about balance and harmony, and it's true, but it's in different forms. There's balance and harmony between each of the buildings. Let me just stop here. When you talk about monumental architecture, like a palace, a Buddhist temple, a monastery complex, maybe a, a provincial administrative center, uh, aristocratic home in Europe, you would have traditional architecture, a big monumental building, the north wing, the south wing, first floor, second floor, third floor. In China and Korea, and to some extent in Japan, it doesn't work that way. For each function, there's one big building, which is in a courtyard. Low buildings surround it, which is where, let's say, they have the libraries, maybe, and people storing paper, um, records and the like, and then the central building. You want to go to another administrative part of that compound, you go out of the building, through the gate, over to another compound with another courtyard. So it's a totally different um, aspect in palaces and, uh, and administrative centers. So there should be balance and harmony among each of the buildings in the palace, in the compound, in the aristocratic home, and definitely with the surrounding nature. Woven into the design is fine art and artisan works, philosophy, literature, poetry, calligraphy. Just a minute. Is that distorted? Yeah, it is. Darn it. Ah, oh, breaks my heart. <laughs> oh. There's something wrong with the system. It's, it's just hideous. I don't know why. There's something wrong with it. I can't, I can't really, uh, yeah, it's, it's all squeezed in. It's too short. I'm sorry, I can't really, I'll tell you what it is, but you can't see it and you can't feel it from these photographs because there's something wrong with the computer that squeezed it in from, squeezed it from left to right and destroys all the beauty. Anyway, to make a long story short, on the roof you have a, a curve on the top which is called Yongmaru, a curve, two curves coming down on these roof ridges which are Nedilmaru, and then a curve at the end left to right, and then a curve from top to bottom, the whole roof, and left to right. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six fundamental curves in the roof. No curve, no length of the, of the structure should be too long, too short, or out of proportion, out of balance, and it's purely aesthetic. Out of balance with the other. They should all, when your eyes follow it top to bottom, there should be nothing that sticks out at you uh, and is obtrusive. It's really sad because it's a gorgeous building. <laughs> what a pity. This is a little better, but not much. <laughs> yeah, again, one, two, three, four, five, six. The Japanese took this idea from the Koreans. Thank you. Don't forget that Japan's traditional culture, the vast majority of it, came from Korea to Japan. 
So it, just like in Europe, it, it went from one to the next to the next country. So it was from China to Korea, Koreanized, Korea to Japan, and of course Japanized. When the Japanese took it, they had a, a predilection to codify everything. This compared this angle compared with that, with that should be 3 to 2 to 1.5. And everything followed that stricture. But the design is very different. So in both of, these, both of these buildings, you have the roof, which is already dynamically harmonic. Below, the distance from the ground to the top of the platform, top of the platform to the first wood, the height of the pillar, the width between each of the bays, each one of these wooden proportions, same thing. There should be no depth or width that is too wide or deep for the other proportions. They all should be perfectly proportional. And it gets a little strange because even the pillar or beam itself, its width, of course, is very important. If this pillar were two-thirds its size, it would look too skinny. If it were one-third bigger, it would look too fat, aesthetically. Even though architecturally it doesn't need to be that big, it is for the aesthetics of what's around it. By the way, that, I, won't, I won't do that, it's too much detail. I had a problem with that. <laughs> Interior design. There are, there are poetry and literature and philosophy quotations throughout the building on placards. That already is an art form and a literature art form. They're executed with beautiful calligraphy. Calligraphy is another art form. The wood finishing totally different concept from Europe or even from China. It's a very discreet, understated, very soft approach. Very understated refinement, soothing and peaceful rather than look at how rich I am approach of a lot of the princes in, uh, in um, Europe as well as I say in China. I'm not saying anybody's good, better, best. I just find it fun, the differences from one to the other. Art is everywhere in these buildings, on scrolls, doors, screens, Frame panels. Here's a good example. This is the wooden floored room. This is the outside with a little porch. You can see the rafters. And this is philosophy in beautiful, beautiful calligraphy. Here are two gentlemen. This is a late Chosen Dynasty photograph, very well known. And they're playing chess. This is a heated floor room with a beautiful screen, paintings, um, high form of art. This is a uh, piece of ceramic with flowers in it, sitting on a, um, a flower stand that is just the right height in comparison with the vase, in comparison with the plant. The doors are development of a Chinese character. The Chinese character has a meaning and is usually related with the philosophy that the owner wants for the building, the environment he wants for his family to live in and understand. So everything is tied together. From the name of the building, to the design on the door, to the philosophy on the, um, on the placards, everything is woven together. Here's another really fine example. This is a heated floor room. This is the wooden floor room. And you have these beautiful paintings. The sliding doors slide behind them. Here's another good example. So we have sliding doors with lattice work and painting on each side. And this is the acha uh, design of, moon, uh, of door. This is an extremely sophisticated aristocratic estate built in 1816 on the east coast of Kangwon province. This is in a pleasure pavilion. And these are the sliding doors which have kipul hicha, happiness and or peacefulness, whatever you like. And on, the, on these doors are panels of what are called the Four Gentlemen of Nature. Meran, Kuk, Chup, Mehua, um, oh shit, what's Mehua? Um, sorry? Plum, thank you. This is bad, I've been here 47 years, it's getting to me. <laughs> yes. So we have Plum, Meran, uh, Orchid, Bamboo, and Chrysanthemum in different forms with magnificent brushwork each of them are signed, and there's a little poetic word on them. You can't see it in this painting, but at the bottom, 
no, I don't have it. At the bottom of each of them is a little poem. And around the room, there are six of these in this room. And each poem is different and tells a story from one poem to the next. So you have fine art. You have the myth of the four gentlemen of nature. You have uh, the architecture involved with it, poetry, and literature. This is pure literature on other doors in this same building, 1816. Chun Ha Gong. It's in the same one. Um, under heaven, everybody can come and go in this, in this beautiful building, is what it's saying. And this was made by a very famous man for this building when it was when he was visiting. And that's very often happens, that the owner has guests who are very educated, sophisticated, maybe talented with calligraphy, and they talk and develop a theme, and the man takes that theme and puts it in calligraphy and gives it as a gift to the owner who puts it on his walls. If it's a Giseng party, the Giseng girls make a song about it, but we won't get into that, yes. This is a 20th century building, and I want to emphasize this as we move on in this talk, that the 20th century Hanok are just as valuable as the 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th century traditional architecture, but Korean people and the Korean government for all this time do not accept that. Because they were built during the Japanese period, they have a bad smell to them or something like that. But everything is the same. Here we have the beautiful paintings on the sliding doors that slide behind them. You have beautiful calligraphy on the doors going up to the attic. Beautiful mother of pearl work. Everything's still there. And it's probably 1930s. Um, here's another house with beautiful sliding doors. Um, and the door panels. This is my house. Sorry. Yeah. I just couldn't find a photograph, so I... Photograph. <laughs> Yeah. So to make a long story short, sunken kitchen to allow cooking and underfloor heating at the same time. By the way, when the kitchen comes down, it creates a big space above it, which is fantastic. It's a big attic. What's the biggest complaint every housewife has in an apartment? There's no place to put anything. Hanok have more storage space than any apartment ever would dream of having. The modern wooden floor, I, I need to mention very briefly that the selection of wood in these, I don't have a fantastic photograph, but this wood here, this is where the woods are the most beautiful. The wood grain is selected very fine and it must be the same grain throughout the type of wood. This is a heavy beam. Under it you have a very light beam. So it's, you notice the big heavy beams are all curved and sanded so that they're soft. So when you look from the top to the bottom, big heavy beam and under it a thin beam, if it had a sharp edge on it, it would stick out and be obtrusive as it comes to the small beam. So they make a transition of just cutting it very gently and maybe in the one below they'll put fine grooves across also to soften the effect of the wood. So there is nothing that is not finished with beautiful grooving, or curving to make the flow from top to bottom, just like the roof, nothing obtrusive must stick out and offend you. All the, all the ondel floor rooms have these kapchang, those are the panels with the fine art paintings behind which the sliding doors move. The floor is heavy floor paper oiled or lacquered, as you saw. This shiny floor here is, is very beautiful and very warm. Sitting on, of course, silk Whoops, where'd he go? There he is. Silk cushions, always, in the traditional houses. Beautiful tiny tables, which are used for a single person to have a common meal, or for tea, or for wine. And that's how everybody can eat in their own room. Because you make the food in the kitchen, you put it on one of these little tables, and you just take it into the room, sit on your silk cushion, and eat. And when you're finished, you take it back and hope somebody else does the dishes. One other aspect is when you're sitting, sitting in the room, this room and the others, and you look outside, the view of the gardens and indeed the distant hills and mountains is framed in the door. But the extent to which it's framed is much greater because the door, than a Western building because the doors are from ceiling to floor. 
And that view must be also in, sorry, your house and the interior decorating must be in reasonable harmony in design, selection of paintings, even selection of the poetry and philosophy with what is outside. Right, so that's basically, I mean, I, I could talk on this for three hours, but we won't do that, Brother Anthony, don't worry. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> oh, he's scary, this guy here, yes. <laughs> right, anyway. Just very quick here, I'm going to review what was here. This is the doomsday. The major government compounds. So we have royal palaces in five different categories. I can't see for beans. Unfortunately, I can't take the microphone with me either. Uh, here we go. Okay. So we have the... Uh, Palaces in five different categories in Seoul. There were five palaces with throne halls. Those are called the legal palace. Uh, the biggest one is called the legal palace, and the all others are all called secondary throne palace, yi gung. And then there are what you call detached palaces with no throne, and those are for what I call the loser prince the one who doesn't get to be king. And daddy the king says, don't take it so hard, I'll give you a nice little palace over on the side. It's much like a stately home more than, uh, more than a big palace. <clears throat> Education, you have Confucian school, the famous one in Seoul. And then again, outside, there are all these other school compounds that have been there for hundreds of years. Indeed, Korea is one of the first countries in Asia to have a nationwide school system. Totally ignored and forgotten are the military fortresses protecting Seoul and indeed military compounds throughout the country. What the purpose of this was a um, Chosun dynasty, this is 1392 until 1910, um, planning for military defense was mountain military bases, fortresses, which covered a huge area and subsidiary other lower mountain bases under them. That was the, the basic defensive uh, philosophy. So there were way over 200 of these military bases nationwide as of 1910 when the Japanese took over and each one had 20 to 80 buildings in them. There probably aren't more than 20 buildings remaining of all of those. So here we have Popgung, this is where the king lived, Kyungbok Palace. It had 300, more than 300, about 350 buildings in 1910. By 1945, when the Japanese finished their demolitions, there were between 12 and 18, depending if you count the pavilions on top of the walls. Of, yeah, anyway, I won't go, there's too much detail. The detached palaces, they did not touch them. These were demolished from the 1960s through 2006. There's another whole set of palaces outside. Because we're running out of time, I'm just gonna run through this because it's easy to see. This is Seoul, 1890s, indeed 1910. So here's Kyungbok Palace. For those of you who drive to your embassies and offices or schools every day, here's, here's Kwangamun Gate with this beautiful um, wall and two towers. And this was called the uh, Haknalge, the crane wings the heads here at the top, and these are the tips of his wing. Here's the main audience hall, and in front of all the government, built the government offices. Here it is again, Kwangamun Palace. These are all government offices. This was the center of government. Same thing, you've driven by this how many times? Kwangamun Gate, Kyungbok Palace, these are all government offices on, the other, on each side. Here we are, 300 plus buildings in 1910, and 18 buildings in 1945. The Japanese occupied this palace when they assassinated Queen Min in 1896 and they kept occupying it continuously until it was turned, it was totally demolished. Interesting, everything disappeared inside the buildings and the Japanese denied that they took it, which is kind of difficult when you have 2,500 Japanese troops in the palace, but hey, what are you going to do? Yeah, and here we have a photograph of demolition in the background and then construction of a new Japanese building on the property. This is what subsidiary government 
buildings. This, this is like the equivalent of Seoul City Hall. And there's the same structure, the same kind of palace building. This, is, this looks like the war ministry, doesn't it? It means business. But it's a gorgeous building in terms of, again, its scope and scale. You have what I call a dynamically balanced roof over a dynamically balanced wooden structure. So the two dynamics blend with each other architecturally. This is the east wall of Kyungbok Palace, where if you drive, you go into the back door of, Chungwa, of the Blue House. This is what it looked like in um, all the way up to 1960. Whoops, sorry. It had a stream. This was originally designed and laid out in 1390s. Beautiful stone bridges over it. The stream was totally paved. And uh, in 1967, it's a much better job, don't you think? Yes, it looks much better. Get rid of those damn 500-year-old bridges and all the other stonework. Changdeok Palace and Changyong Palace. Uh, uh, yes, Changyong Palace. This is what it originally looked like. I'd say in this, it's, it's a little better. About 90% were demolished. Kyungbok Palace is 97% of all the buildings were demolished by the Japanese. Pyeolgung, there's only one detached palace, Loser King. But this was actually a different purpose, but it's the only one to show you. These were quite magnificent. This is the head of the household's um, compound. This is what it looks like inside. Beautiful uh, calligraphy, doors, and the rest. All art. This is where women and children would live. So you can see these detached palaces were not painted. But they were quite magnificent. Here's another one, Andong Detached Palace. This was demolished in 1966. Another one, Sadonggung was the fifth son of King Kojong. That was demolished continuously all after liberation, after the Korean War. The last building in 2006 of Sadong Palace was demolished. The gates of Seoul, most of them were demolished. Very few remain, as you know. But they are rebuilding some of them. Hengung, palaces in the country palaces. There were about 20 of them, actually, in total, outside. This is one that is in Naman Sansong. This is the South Fortress. If you ever want to see a, a chosen fortress, this was the largest ever built in the history of the country. Indeed, it goes all the way back to the Three Kingdoms period of Shilla. So it's about 1,500 years tradition. And they've rebuilt the palace at terrific cost, having demolished it, the last three buildings in 1975. Here is Suwon Detached Palace, is the largest ever built, with, and it's truly a work of architectural art. If you ever have a chance, go and see. It's the epitome. They've done a good job of rebuilding the buildings that the Japs, uh, sorry, the Japanese gentlemen, uh, dear, be careful, uh, politically correct, all this diplomats here. Yeah. Um, they demolished it in the 19 late 30s and late, sorry, 20s and 30s. And you can see the scale is huge. This is the king's personal living quarters. This is the size of it. This is a 1790s woodblock print. And here's a painting of the palace. These are what the fortress walls, this is the best preserved walled city in Korea. Korea had over 300 walled villages, towns, and cities in the country. So the demolitions are roughly in this scale. The percentages you can see here, Kyungbok, Changdok, Changgyong, Kyunghee, Doksu. These are the main palaces. And all the country palaces were pretty much 100% demolished, except for those two buildings in Naman Sansung. Pyeolgung, these were all Pyeolgung demolished. That's the imperial household. We won't do that. My, one of my favorite complaints, everybody says how wonderful it is Chunggye Chun has been beautifully fixed and all that. Well, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Chunggye Chun was a beautiful stream lined with cut stone. The stream bed was, was paved with huge stones with all these beautiful stone bridges over it. One stone bridge, here's what's called Supyo Kyo, which means the watermark bridge. Here's another bridge. And this is right up until 1969. 
And here's the only bridge that remains, which was disassembled and moved to another site. But you can see, this is really, we're talking something 600 years old, demolished by the orders of the government in 1969, 1970. And now they've made a new and improved one. This is the bridge, this is the new bridge of the new Chungichan that replaced this. Gorgeous, isn't it? Yes, sorry to be so. Provincial government centers, I'll do this real quick because we've just run out of time. This is what you'd expect. It's a, a provincial center, county, village, town, whatever, <coughs> government center. <coughs> this is the, this is actually in North Korea, but I'm showing you because it's humongous. There are over a hundred buildings in this central area, and then you have the, the town walls around it. But these were magnificent. This is one building, pleasure building, pavilion remaining from this compound. You can see it is a palace. The Japanese demolished 99.99999% and the walls, over 250. This is a magnificent work of art, architectural art. This is just to show you what it was like if you went into the thing in about 1920. This is one in Jeju that's been restored. This is in um, Hamhung, North Korea. This is the only interior I've ever found that is in color. Military compounds, Naman Sansung, magnificent walls, magnificent walls. In most of them, they're in bad shape and falling apart, but the um, they're trying to restore some of it as we speak. There's almost nothing left. There are two buildings left of the naval com military compounds. So we have here, what I'm talking about, is a body of architecture that is equivalent to a European country, nationwide, of magnificent traditional architecture with the aspects scientific, aesthetic, and philosophical that I've spoken about that was totally eviscerated from 1910 to 1945 purposefully and tragically the memory of which is gone because there's nothing left to see. People do not understand what was here to know what's missing, to know what they should restore. It's only just beginning which is very hopeful. There is a, uh, what do you say, regional pride is now spearheading archaeological excavation to to rebuild. So we're seeing some of it. Even Hidden libraries were demolished. This is the last aristocratic estate, the equivalent of a chateau or schloss. And this was enormous. And this is what it looks like today. It's the only one that has survived totally intact. It's in Gangneung, east coast of Korea. If you ever have a chance, go and see it. I lived here for five years. This is a long time ago. Yeah, and here's a gorgeous, I actually lived in this building, and you're going to say, oh, that must have been tough. It was. The first three and a half years, we, had, we didn't have electricity because the electricity used to come from a power station just over the border in North Korea. So <laughs> that's what happened. And uh, of course, I had to crawl on my hands and knees and light a fire every day in the damned firebox to keep myself from freezing to death. But aesthetically made up for all the creature comforts. I mean, it floats on a sea of lotus. I mean, this is the quintessence of the highest level of Korean architectural and landscape art form. I won't do this, this is too much. Hanok in Seoul, we just spoke about it. We all know about Pukchon. Pukchon, the wonderful Hanok preservation area. But actually, they destroy the original building and build a, a gooder one. Here we go. Look at the old stonework. They tore down the original building and built something. Usually the layout, everything, the architecture has nothing to do with the original. Sometimes they rip everything out, leaving only the bones of the poor old man, and then build something totally different inside it. Here are some of the remaining. There are probably about 3,500 is all that remain in Seoul of Hanok. Unfortunately, as was mentioned, Korean people generally say Hanok are uncomfortable, cold, dirty, expensive, everything's bad. The only solution is rip it down and build a nice new comfortable concrete building. The European concept is, in my opinion, worldwide the best in terms of preservation. 
You preserve everything that is original in the building. Every doorknob, every little fitting, every window. And yet you, make, you can make heating and bathroom and kitchen and electrical, everything else, plumbing, while still having a balance and preserving the original. But that is not the case in all of Asia. In all of Asia, old building is bad, tear it down, build a new one. It's beginning to change in both China and in Korea, but it's almost too late. These are in Songbukdong, at the low end of it. This is a cute little house. It's gorgeous. Inside is still impeccably perfect. Two people in their 70s, actually he's in his 80s, live there. These are just some examples of Hanok that have not been demolished in Seoul that are original. Um, that's my house there, by the way. Yeah. Oh, dear. That's my neighbor. And again, this was built in 1938. Philosophy, calligraphy, all still remains in these 20th century Hanok. I love the 7-Eleven and a Hano. <laughs> this is just wonderful. At least they didn't demolish it. Good heavens, give the break. Yeah, the magnificent roof with its gardens in the courtyard. This is looking out of um, Starbucks in Songbuktong at the bottom. And if you see there, this is what Seoul looked like originally. And there were these two-story commercial buildings, traditional architecture. There were hundreds and hundreds of these. There are probably less than five left. But there is no awareness or program to preserve these kinds of structures that is, has been effective. And we've gone from way over maybe a half a million Hanok to less than 4,000 today. Here it is. Here's another commercial building. And behind it was the owner's home. So this is what Seoul looked like. This is Pagoda Park, and this is bloody well in Sadong and, and uh, Nagwandong behind it. It was all Hanok in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Here's Anamdong in the northeast. And here are owners protesting against these government programs to demolish the whole neighborhood, forced sale, and then build apartments. This is a neighborhood all Hanok. And it was known as the flower neighborhood. Every alley had a different flower theme that everybody maintained. Gorgeous. So it was all Hanok until the government started, the city government started it. And this says, we are now having a demolition uh, so the, um, of this for redevelopment and building apartments. So that was the Hanok I just showed you with the flowers. Going, going, gone, finished. But there's hope for the future. There is a growing awareness. The government, city government has made a fund for uh, supporting people who have Hanuk. At my urging and fighting, they've managed to apply this across the entire city, not just in Pukchon or some designated area. The general public awareness has risen. People want to live in a Hanuk now. My God, what's going on? And, and they're doing it nicely and doing it well. The taste factor is still a problem. But it is, it is improving, and new government policies are pushing it. Thank you very much. Can we say thank you very much? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Um, you will find in your uh, pamphlet there is a question.